Hey friends, welcome back to another Seed Talk with Lisa and Lane. Hey Lane. Hello, are you ready to talk about some netting? Woo, you know what? I am a a, a steak pounding girl this time of the year. I mean- I know you are. I, and because let me tell you, and it's just, just the other day I looked at something that didn't get staked and I had to rescue it. And it's like I lost most of the crop. It was more work. I, it's like, why did I just not- net this at the proper time and take care of it anyway. So I'm glad we're talking about it because people just don't get it. It's so important. All right, friends, before we dive into netting, if you don't know what that is, you're in for a interesting discussion here. Um, just want to remind everybody that you can head over to thegardenersworkshop.com to see all this other things that Lane and I are busy doing. There's a fully stocked garden shop over there with all the seeds you hear us mention as well as tools, seeds, supplies. All right, Lane, let's get started. All right. Well, today, like I mentioned, we're going to be talking about supporting your flowers, which is just so critical when you're trying to grow cut flowers. You don't want them to end up flopping and then they start growing crooked or they get dirty. So we're going to be talking about netting. And there's lots of questions we get about netting, like do I really have to net my flowers? Are there any that I can get away with not netting? When do I put the netting up? What height should it be at? How should I space my stakes? All those sorts of questions. We're going to go through that today. And those are all questions I can answer. That is for sure. All oh, right, yeah. so let's get started. Okay, so let's start off with the obvious question, which is why should I consider netting my flowers? And what are the risks of not using netting or some other supports? Sure. So what is so hard to imagine, particularly if you've never grown cut flowers before, I mean, one of the aspects of cut flowers is you want tall stems and you're looking for big flowers in most cases, and that would either be in bud form or fully open, depending on which flower they get they become little flags out in the garden or little sailboat sails. And um, sometimes, you know, wind can take them down. But for me, I see the most damage from downpours of rain. You know, the bloom gets heavy, the rain is pounding them, and they literally just crumple to the ground. Um, and there's really no coming back from that. Um, and so, you know, it's really different than landscape flowers, landscape plants are literally bred to be short to prevent these types of problems that we're talking about. But if you are growing for a cutting garden, you want taller stems, and this is one of the prices you have to pay. Um, so if it's important to you and it's a flower that you actually want to be able to cut and have it as beautiful as it looked when it first started, then you need to support it to keep it upright through the process until it's time to cut it. Yeah. You want them to grow straight stems. You want them to stay upright. You don't want them getting dirty on the ground. You want them to stay clean. And that's a really good point about the bedding varieties, because I think there are a lot of people that maybe in the past they've grown bedding varieties of snapdragons or zinnias, and they're just very short. And then they transition to growing cut flowers, and they're surprised at how tall these can get. I mean, looking at this beautiful image that you have up, if you know you're listening on a podcast, you need to check us out on our YouTube channel because this is actually a garden from when we were shooting um, for my book, Vegetables Love Flowers. And I mean, those flowers are waist and above and chest tall. All it would take is one good 10 minute downpour and that would have been, they'd all be in the pathway. They'd yes. all be crooked. I mean, there's just so many reasons why you don't want to not support your flowers. I agree. And I also agree with you that rain, a heavy, sudden downpour, that's what does it every time here in our garden. Oh my gosh. I mean, there's probably finger marks in the windowsill <laughs> that looks out over my garden. You know, there's always something that we just don't get to in time because we have so much to do. And, you know, two years ago, I did not, um, and it was it was vegetables love flowers. So it was probably four years ago. Um, we didn't net the scabiosis and that stuff is like chest high yeah. and spindly. And every time it rained, I was like glued to the window. And Steve finally just said, close the drape. <laughs> Believe it or not, we lost only a few, but that is the exception instead of the rule. Okay, now we're going to move on to our next question, which is, broadly speaking, which flowers do you recommend netting and which do you choose not to net and why? So some flowers, 
They might just be really short and the stage you're harvesting them in makes them less prone to flopping or perhaps installing netting just makes it such a pain to harvest. So you leave it off or maybe you just grow a lot of something and you're willing to take the risk that oh, maybe some of it won't turn out. So which do you net in general? Which do you recommend netting? And then what are some examples of ones that you risk not netting? Sure. So first off, I feel like the smaller the grower you are, or if you're a home gardener with a small garden, that means the flowers you have are pretty significant to you because you don't have a whole bunch more. I think those flowers, you know, if in doubt, you net the bed, you know, you just net and that is your ins insurance policy. You know, not often do we need a seat belt, but the day you need it, you're very happy that you had it on, right? Um, so in general, we net pretty much everything um, with the exception of a few. And the picture you have up is a great image. Um, snaps on the left. Snaps definitely should be netted. Sometimes because many of them bloom so early for us because we fall plant, sometimes they get started without the netting. And I just take the bullet and hope for the best, right? The picture on the right are Iceland poppies. Now, there's two reasons that we don't net Iceland poppies. One is it's kind of short, but more importantly, we actually harvest it before the flower opens. And when their flowers are in bud, um, oftentimes they aren't as susceptible to rain and wind as they are. Like, for instance, think coxcomb. Those grow into those big, heavy heads. I mean, it's like a sponge on the top of that tall stem, and that's a real problem. Iceland poppies, just like peonies, we harvest them when they're in bud so they aren't as susceptible and we just find it easier to not net them. Um, and then to speak to you mentioned some of those that we just are willing to take the risk, that would be sunflowers for us. Sunflowers definitely benefit from support because they are tall, they've got heavy head and the wind just will take them down and so will rain. However, we planted so many so often we just took the gamble. But if I was a small grower, so let's just say I was a small grower and I planted 50 a week um, and I was doing a bouquet subscription and, um, you know, I really relied on three to five of those flowers each week for those bouquets, you better count on that I would support them because you really can't, I mean, it would be a really big hit to actually lose those for one week. You'll, you'll lose them for one week and then you'll never let that happen again. Um, so that's if they're in bud and they're short, okay. And then the other one that really should be netting, netted, but we really can't find anybody to cut it netted <laughs> is gumfrina. Gumfrina um, for us gets super tall. I mean, it, it taps out between 24 and 30 inches easily. And it could do netting because it's a little ball. It develops in the garden but it's just kind of tangly and branchy. So it's really difficult to manage. So that's another one that we just decide to take a gambled risk. And by the way, just today I said to Bo, I was walking the field and Bobo was still here. I said, Bobo, how did we plant all this gum? We have like 10 to 15 feet of bed of every gumfrina that we sell, Lane. That's a lot of gumfrina. I think it's like six different colors. That's a lot. That's a lot. Anyway, so I can assure you that it will not be netted if they want me to cut. I am the Gumfrina cutter, um, <laughs> but we'll lose some. And that's just that's just a risk you kind of get more familiar with and are feel more confident about the more you actually grow stuff. Because Gumfrina is a really important crop if you're doing bouquets. Okay, now we're going to talk about what are some of the pros and cons of plastic netting and what are some alternatives? So why is plastic netting your go-to on the farm, Lisa? The reason that I use flower support netting, which is a plastic product, um, is first off, it is the quickest to install and the most efficient in my experience. Um, and because of, we grow so many annuals that just produce tons of stems, um, the uh, some of the other methods just don't seem to work quite as well. We also uninstall netting and reuse it from year to year. So it's not like it's going to the landfill. When it's installed at the proper time, in the proper way, um, it just drastically reduces any threat of pets, people, and wildlife getting caught in it. So that's why I use the plastic netting. Um, and 
the cons would be um, some people just don't know how to install it. I see pictures on social media of incorrect installed um, netting and they're just commiserating how horrible it is to cut through. Well, it's because of the way it was installed. And so the cons, people um, don't install it properly and then they leave it on too long after they finished putting before they try to remove it and it becomes impossible to remove. Um, and so that's a really big challenge for people. And then you have all this greenery caught up in the netting. I mean, I and I've been there, I've done it, you know, years ago, but we've really mastered it. It's just really all about doing it in a timely manner. Um, some of the alternatives, which this is a great image because that gump frena is in fact what's called corralled. Corralling means and it, the reason it's corralled is because I followed my rule of not netting Gumphrina. We needed it for a book shoot and it laid down because of a torrential downpour. It was so tall. I mean, it was like a V. It just laid right down the middle, um, was splayed. So um, corralling is installing stakes in strategic spots and then taking twine. I prefer to use green jute so it's not so visible and just running it all back and forth. Um, to help provide stems, but you don't realize how much back and forth is really needed to do what six by six flower support netting does. You need a lot more stakes and it's just a lot more cumbersome to do, especially after the fact. So I use corralling for CPR to resurrect something that has gone down that wasn't netted usually. Um, and so, but a lot of people do corralling. I mean, it's to each your own is what you perfect for your conditions and for what you're growing. And then how about options like grow through metal rings or even sometimes people install metal mesh for shorter flowers? Yes, um, that's a good point. And you know that those grow through rings, which are metal and usually coated, are great for home gardening or, or home gardener um, cutting gardens or in your landscape uh, because they're more permanent. But you would not want to do that in a 10 foot bed, you know, I mean, that would take a lot of grow through. So those do work really, really well and are more of a permanent solution. Yeah. So there are definitely alternatives if you want to avoid plastic products or you don't want to use netting for some other reason. Yeah. I typically do a combination of corralling and metal supports here in my home garden. But the main reasons you use it on the farm, Lisa, are that it's quick and easy to install. It's cost effective. It's yeah. reusable for a certain number of years. How many years would you say you get out of your netting? The netting, pro if you store it properly. And so that would mean putting it on, removing it, rolling it up, taping it shut. And we put it into our potting shed where UV, um, it's the UV rays um, that really age it quickly and it is in pretty much darkness and probably three years, maybe three to four years at the most. And we do have an entire episode on removing and storing your netting. So that's episode 59 if you want to go back and listen to that. Okay, now we're going to move on to the specific products you use. So what is the type of netting you use, Lisa? And which stakes do you recommend? There are metal options, there are wood options. What do you have to say about that? Sure. So first off, when you have to stake as much as I do, you use any stake that you have available. <laughs> so I have used a vast array and kind of have come to a couple of favorites. So we do use the six inch flower support Hortonova um, and it comes in a 36 inch wide piece. Um, my beds are 30 inches. So we are always cutting one row off at least. I have learned that I install my netting, as you can see in the image on the right, my netting is usually a tad bit narrower than the bed. That helps for a lot of maintenance reasons. A few flowers might grow on the edge and not get netted, but that's really okay. Um, and so you don't want any netting hanging loose. So if, for instance, you don't use the full width, you need to cut off that ex excess. Um, and the stakes that I, my preferred stakes are a two by two inch oak, steak. They're called tomato steaks. Sometimes you can buy them um, at a big box store, but most often it's like a landscape house. That's like the place that landscapers go to buy supplies or um, a construction place, not like the big box stores. There's places where contractors go for that are doing, I'm trying to think what they're actually sold for. You know, that orange silk cloth they put up around construction yes. sites. It's where contractors go to buy that stuff. 
And that's where I bought mine. And they used to, they come in five foot tall, four foot and three foot. And we actually buy um, the four or the three foot size now, because I have learned you don't really need the steak to be super tall, which makes it really hard to pound it in if it's so tall. Um, but those last me about two to three years, at least they're fairly inexpensive. My second choice would be metal T-posts. Those are definitely a more of an upfront investment, but they last for years, even if they're rusty. I actually have some that I use that came off a trash pile. Somebody threw away a whole bunch of them. They were rusty when I got them 15 years ago, and I still use them today. So aesthetics don't really matter to me um, because they do a really great job um, and they're really strong. And I will tell you that the flower support netting um, will hold anything. It's the stakes that are the link, the weak link in the process, either the stake you use or it's not driven in deep enough. Um, but we have really, I mean, we've staked dahlias, very dense canopies of lisianthus, um, and it does a great job. Going back to the Hordanova netting, I just also wanted to mention that because it has six inch by six inch squares, it's really convenient to lay a piece of that on your soil while you're planting and use it as a guide for spacing your transplants. Yes. But just make sure you never leave loose netting in the garden or it could become a wildlife hazard or a tripping hazard for people as well. Right. I mean, the rule here on our farm, um, yeah, Bobo has a piece of flower support netting that is her planting grid. And I mean, she rolls it out, plants rolls it up, and then she waters. So it's never left down in the garden because that's where a lot of the devastation comes um, from people, pets, and wildlife getting caught in it. And it is easy to happen. I've been caught by netting before. Um, yeah. we It's just a, it is a pretty firm rule around here. There is never loose netting in the garden. Okay, now we're going to move on to talking about installation, and we'll cover the full-on installation in our next question. But first, I wanted to talk about when should people install netting in a bed, and what height should that netting be placed at? Because you might think, oh, let me put the netting in right after I make my beds. It'll be done and ready. There are some disadvantages to that, but you also want to catch it before the plants start growing above where you're going to be placing that netting, or that just becomes a nightmare as well. Sure. Um, so that's a really good question. So when should you install the netting? I learned as a dog owner, I have golden retrievers, I've always have, and a really important way that I help them to not walk through my beds to stay on the pathways is that we don't install netting until the plant is just about to the height that it needs to be to just pop through the netting. So the netting is normally installed at about the half way of maturity. That means if a plant is going to be 48 inches tall when it's grown up, the netting hovers between 24 and 30 inches. So you wouldn't be installing that netting until the plants are like 15 to 20 inches tall so that your everybody can see that there's a barricade there. You know, there's something to go through. So that's one of the reasons that we delay actually installing the netting. Um, and there are some crops, and this is very timely because let me tell you what I just experienced today in the garden. So we love growing Persian cress, which is a cool flower. We fall plant it and very early spring plant it, and we're actually experimenting with succession planting it because it's not the bloom that you're after. It's those beautiful texture, little green seed pods that develop following that bloom. But let me tell you, Cress, when you because we plant it when it's most happy, cool flower, right? It grows super tall, and those heads get so dense with seed pods, it folds. So I that happened to me last year, and so just you know this latest crop uh, before we had a rainstorm a couple weeks ago, I went out and I thought, all right, I'm lifting the netting just a little bit higher to provide that additional support. And it folded anyway. I didn't lift it high oh. enough. So there are some crops you have to learn that with. Um, and so I cut it all and we, we, we were able to um, actually get some that hadn't bent. Um, but there are things that you're going to live and learn that there's no blanket rule for anything in gardening and farming. <laughs> so you'll have to live and learn. But that's just a great lesson that I know now. If I fall or very early spring planted, that netting needs to be at the top 
of the canopy, not down low, and we'll see what happens. One thing I wanted to add about installing the netting too early, it does limit your access reaching into the bed when you have the netting up. So let's say you just made a bed and you put your netting up before you ever even planted anything. That just makes it kind of a pain to get your transplants in. And then right. even for weeding, imagine a direct seated bed. If you put it in too soon, how are you going to run your hoe along that bed? So those are just some things to think about too. Yeah, that's a good point. What about if you needed to install row cover? If you were going to have a freak late frost or low temperature? Yeah, so definitely timing. I mean, I am the girl that loves to like get everything done and checked off my list. But we've learned that that's not how it is with netting. How about if you have plants with different heights in the same bed? Do you avoid that? Or would you use different pieces of netting placed at different heights? How would you deal with that? Um, we try to, no, we don't use different pieces. Um, but I try to, so we definitely now plant in long beds and there's multiple different crops because of the way that we're farming now, right? And so when we're lining them up, it's like where the gumfrina is, all the gumfrinas together because we know we're not going to net that, right? Um, and the grasses, we don't typically net um, for all those reasons. And so we try to plant the crops in order of their height with respect to that so that you can just make the most of it. Okay, so now could you just walk us through your process for installing netting and also touch on how far apart those stakes should be ideally? So the stake spacing can depend on the crop. On the right is lisianthus, and on the left is just regular summer annuals. Um, lisianthus, because we plant it so densely, um, we now typically in big long beds like this one was, we would put stakes about every five feet because we put, think about this, eight rows. Lisianthus is a crop that we like to get three to four blooms open before we cut it, which makes the canopy super heavy. Um, and so we um, have watched that just lay down before. So Lisianthus is the exception every five feet. Everything else is spaced about five to 12 feet. Um, and again, installed properly, which means it's pulled tautly. I usually do one end and then go to the other end of the bed, pull it taut from end to end, install the, the stakes. And then I go down one side of the bed, um, line it up, you know, putting this. I always want the footprint of my stakes in the bed, not in the pathway, because often we are mowing pathways and we don't want to have to go around stakes. Um, so, and then I go around to the other side and when I'm going down that side and installing, you're pulling the netting taut from side to side. So the netting is not skin tight, but it is very taut, which allows birds to land on it and sit on it instead of getting caught in it, those types of things. All right. And do you have any other netting tips you'd like to share with anyone just in general? Um, you only lose important flowers to you once and then you totally understand what the importance is. And um, I wish you see your poppy pods that are up there. Um, we definitely net those because they sit out in the garden for a long time with those pods and they get heavy. They go down one year. I didn't do it. And we lost the majority of our crop. And it's just, it's so much work to get to that point to just see it all ended in one 10 minute downpour is pretty, you know, disheartening. Have you ever used a double layer of netting or is there anything you do that on or do you just stick to the single? We're single. Dave and I spoke about that, <laughs> Dave Dowling and I, and he and I both said, first off, we can't imagine us harvesting through that or that anybody that ever worked for us being willing. And it's, if the, if the, Netting is installed properly at the proper height for that crop and tauntly, you really don't need a second layer. And I can't imagine, I mean, the, the cost that you would have to charge for those flowers for that additional um, labor would be pretty incredible. When you're harvesting through netting, would you say in general, you're pulling up through the netting unless it's extremely branchy and then you might have to pull it down through the netting? Yes, uh, that's a good point. So oftentimes, like on the first cut if for zinnias that weren't pet pinched um, and they're so branchy, right? Um, oftentimes the first cut we pull down under the netting and then all the future ones will grow up through, all the future stems will grow up through the netting and it makes just for easy 
harvesting, because let me tell you what the biggest mistake is, is pulling that netting up in your early harvest practices. And then every harvest is a pain in the neck. You really need to work hard to not move the netting up when you're harvesting. And you don't have to. I've been doing it for a long time and I, I harvest pretty quick through netting. It's all about skill and experience. And I also really liked your tip about removing the netting right away when you know you're done with a bed. That's just a good practice to get into. Yes, it really is. And that just makes it easier, more usable and protects everybody involved. All right. Well, that was it for this episode on netting. Hopefully that helped answer some of your questions and helped you learn how to safely and effectively install netting on your farm or in your garden. And thank you so much for joining us again. We always appreciate your ratings and reviews in a podcast app and your likes and comments over on YouTube. And please make sure to follow or subscribe wherever you're watching or listening so you won't miss any of our future episodes. And be sure to share it with a friend if you are enjoying Seed Talk. And just thank you again for being here with us. Yep. We appreciate every listener and viewer, and we are glad you're here. And remember to drop in over at thegardenersworkshop.com where you can find all your flower support netting needs. Ciao. Bye.